for those who don't know Tim, Tim is an author, he is a musician, he is a stand-up philosopher, and he is a man who wears many hats. <laughs> so uh, uh, I gather you've written 35 books, uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, your co-author of a book that I want to focus on today, which is the, the Jesus Mysteries, co-author with Peter Gandhi, uh, and its sort of companion or sequel book, which is the Jesus and the Lost Goddess, is yeah. that the right title? So to jump off, I think if we're going to summarize what these books are about in one very short sentence, which unfortunately will not do it justice at all, but it's about the concept that Jesus never existed. Is, is that right? Sandra? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably the the tagline that gets people like, oh my goodness. But actually, it's what's more interesting is not that the story isn't about, isn't it an historical story. It, what's more interesting to me is it's a very interesting allegorical myth. So there's two parts to it really. One is going, look, this story which we've been told is history isn't. It's an ancient myth. And if you think about it and you look at the story, it's quite obviously that really. And presenting the evidence why it's a myth. And then the really interesting thing is then going, well, why is, why does it exist? What, what is this myth? What role does it play? And is it, is it, does it, does calling it a myth mean we dismiss it as untrue? Or is actually, does it open up a deeper level of truth than we previously suspected was in the New Testament story? Well, but before we get into the, the deep meaning and the deep truths behind, behind this story, I think uh, it's quite hard to, to find a quite a good jumping off point that can you know begin this. But but um, I think where I started it was from a position of assumption that of course Jesus existed. Sure. Um, I think I share that assumption with most people, mm -hmm. and most atheists would probably assume he existed. Mm -hmm. And I think we share that assumption based on the idea that there must be a historical record of Jesus, a thorough historical record of Jesus. So. So, uh, is that? Is there? No. <laughs> what, what exists? What uh, Christians uh, say the, is... The, the first thing, Luke, I think is to say, look, uh, look, Peter and I both also assumed that Jesus existed. I mean, it was a shock. We didn't set out with an agenda. We were actually doing separate work um, around the ancient mysteries of the pagan mysteries and around the early Christian Gnostics. And it aro arose from that research. It wasn't something we came into it to prove. So, no, there is no... There is no evidence at all. And the evidence which is often claimed, like the references in the history books by the Jewish historian Josephus, they've been well known as, as fakes for a long time. So, so you say they're well known as fakes, do people disagree with you? Is the whole uh, you know, historical orthodox community on board with that? No. I mean, every, I mean certainly they're not on, on board with the um, idea that he didn't exist, but I, I, think, I think a good body of scholarship would go those that there is no solid evidence. So what you're left with is the Gospels, which are faith documents. And what scholarship has done, and this is not us that's done this, has taken those to bits and shown, for instance, three of the Gospels are basically the same Gospel. Mark becomes elucidated into um, uh, Matthew and, and Luke, and then John is quite different. And what you can see is that it was okay to add things because somebody added things over a, a long period. The, the real change comes when you understand the Gnostic Christians. Now, the Gnostics aren't one group. They're a whole variety of groups. And that's interesting. So this early Christianity doesn't start with one thing around a man and then spread. It's actually already lots of different disparate groups around. By the time that Jesus should have been alive, it's not like that. Um, and when you go into the Gnostics, what you find is a completely different form of Christianity. And it's a form of Christianity which is very close to the pagan mysteries. So what we suggest is happening is that the pagan mysteries, which were everywhere around the ancient world, have at their center a various myths, one of which is around a dying and resurrecting God-man. And all of the elements that will make up the Jesus story already exists in those myths. Well, I, I want to get to that. But okay. before we do, um, I think a Christian who's listening to you um, dismiss Josephus might go, oh, hang on, wait, 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 wait a minute. Mm. Um, uh, so, first of all, 
Okay, you're saying that there's no historical record. Josephus, you're saying, uh, I may be pronouncing that wrong, Josephus. Jo Josephus. Yeah. Um, he was a later forgery upon his contemporary writing. Yeah, I mean, what you, what you, I mean, if you, if you want to home in on that in particular, um, you know, basically you've got a few references to Christians in the early histo Roman historians. That's all you've got. And then in Josephus, suddenly you get this beautiful passage about, oh, this wonderful miracle worker and a man, if you can call him a man, and it's all very full of praise. Uh, but it's written in a completely different Greek, and the early Christians never reference it, and they surely would, because it would have been hugely important to them. So it's, it's been inserted, and what that shows you is that the early Christians, once the, it's taken off in Rome, they were looking for something and it wasn't there. So they, so they put it in and that's been a characteristic of the way the history has been manipulated. Is it not there since. because there weren't many historians around? For example, Pontius Pilate, something oh. like that. Is there any evidence of him? Oh yeah, Pontius Pilate is a, is a historical figure, um, but none of the key figures in the Jesus story are like that. So look, just be, it's no surprise there's no evidence. Even if he had existed, um, there could well have been no evidence. Although, you know, if the, if the story is true, if someone came back from the dead, certainly if the night was rent in two and, you know, all of the, all of the miraculous stuff, you'd have thought someone would have noticed that. The dead came out of their graves and someone would have noticed that. But leaving that aside, um, it, yeah, of course, there could have been a miracle worker in that area and we wouldn't know. So it doesn't prove anything. Saying he, there's no record doesn't prove he didn't exist. All it says is there is nothing to suggest he did. Well, um, th th that's, you know, your critics, I, I tried to see what the critics who tried to take you down and, and their arguments. Very they're, good. They're very convinced of their own arguments, but sure. they seem quite, quite feeble to me. But, but one was that um, there's actually no contemporary evidence of Hannibal. Um, who you know crossed the Alps with the elephants, and, and the reason there's none is because the cities were all burned down, and so and so, um, you know, of, of course, uh, the lack of evidence doesn't disprove it. So I've never looked into Hannibal. The, the example people normally use is Julius Caesar, who is a bad example because we have tons of evidence about Julius Caesar. Look, showing you, you can't have negative proof. The fact that uh, there is no solid evidence for what would have been an obscure uh, preacher in. Jerusalem is no surprise. So it doesn't prove anything. So there's, like I said, there's three things which come together in the Jesus mysteries. One is, look, there's nothing compelling which says there definitely was somebody. So we don't know. So that's open. He's missing. Okay, what does that mean? Don't know yet. Then you've got the stuff which I touched on very briefly, which is, hang on a second, here's a different form of early Christianity, which the Roman church, hundreds of years later, turned into the enemy and did their best to suppress, well, actually suppressed, and brutally. And their great complaint for though, about those Christians was that they'd gone pagan, because they were, they were so close to paganism. And the other great complaint is they don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. And they see the story as an allegory of initiation, just like the pagan myths. So then it starts looking like, well, could, that be, could it be the other way around? Most contemporary thinkers go, oh, there probably was a man, and then it's been mythologized. That's what most people think. What we're suggesting is, how about it was a myth that was historicized? Because that actually makes more sense of these early Christians. And what we know of, of the Jewish culture at the time is it's completely, we have a very, very distorted view of it. It's absolutely enmeshed in paganism. The, the place I think that Christian Christianity is actually coming from is probably from Alexandria in Egypt, where you've got a mishmash of these different cultures, including a large percentage of, of uh, the Jewish community. It's a bit like New York. They all speak Greek, which is why all the documents are in Greek. We have what's called intertestamental texts, which just means they're bef between what we call the Old and the New Testament, which are clearly bringing together Jewish mythology and pagan mythology. And then suddenly we get the Gospels. Hang on, these look exactly the same. They're also bringing together pagan and Jewish mythology. So you've got groups in the desert outside Alexandria who are like the Therapeutae, who are Jewish pagans. The person who tells us about it is a guy called Philo, 
And he has two names. He's often called Philo Judaeus, Philo the Jew, and Philo the Pythagorean. So he's a Pythagorean. He's in the pagan mysteries, and he's Jewish. And what it looks like is the Therapeutae are practicing a Jewish form of the mysteries around the myth of Exodus. And the Exodus is about is, is interpreted allegorically, not historically. And it's about coming to the gnosis, the, the knowledge of God. And that's the equivalent of coming to the promised land. And the character that takes you to the promised land in the myth isn't Moses. It's Joshua. And in Greek, the name Joshua is Jesus. So it's quite possible that they're already practicing the mysteries of Jesus or Joshua for hundreds of years, possibly. Long period before it becomes what we recognize as, as the Jesus mysteries, this new thing which emerges. Well, you know, one of the main themes of your book is how this Jesus story is a, a copy of stories from all of you know, many different places. So, so you mentioned a few names, yeah. um, like a, a, a Cyrus, a Dionysus. Who, who is the Jesus story copy of? Who, who it's, it's not a copy of any one story. Um, and, I, and if it was, obviously, I, w people would have noticed that. What it is, is it, it shares what, like Campbell talks about with a myth, having the same anatomy. And the, the example we use in the book, if you think of uh, West Side Story and Romeo and Juliet. It's like they're completely different, but they're not, are they? They're the same anatomy. The same, they are the same story. So if you look at it, you can see that um, all of those elements, like born in a cave, of a virgin, son of God, 12 disciples, water in, changes water into wine at a wedding, preaches love, falls foul of the spiritual authorities, is put to death, comes back. You celebrate his life through taking bread and wine. Sort of twenty fifth of December is that one? Twenty fifth, yeah. These twenty fifth is probably late one actually. But so there's, it's a bit like the, the analogy to try and get it. You've got to think that this myth making is a high art form of the ancient world. So it's a bit like if you looked at sci fi films with a with a message, The Matrix, say, or one of those movies. You could look at it and go, oh, look, they've taken that from that, and they've taken that from that, and they've combined it in a new way. Well, that's what, they, that's what human beings do. And myth makers were doing the same thing. They're taking, well, they're taking that idea from there, and this idea from there, and they're weaving it into a new living story. So the, the, the character of the rising and, uh, dying and rising dead, uh, the god-man had already arisen as Osiris and Dionysus and Serapis and Adonis and Attis and Serapis in, in Alexandria and specifically, and then he becomes Joshua or Jesus. There's also, um, it strikes me, some similarity with uh, Quetzalcoatl as well. I know the Mormons consider Quetzalcoatl to be Jesus who went to the Americas. So then we, then we end up in a whole different thing, which is, which is also interesting, which we don't go into which is to what degree, this is one of the interests that Jung had, to watch to what degree do these, are these myths uh, being passed on by historical connection, which is probably what is happening in the Mediterranean, but how connected is the human psyche? So that are there archetypes that are going to arise, even if there is no direct connection? Unless there was a direct connection we don't know about, which is also possible. Well, so these original biblical authors, when they're coming up with this story, um, and then later trying to supplant it as the one true story. It, it strikes me kind of as odd that they pick from stories that already exist and, and then claim that their one is true. So, for example, we all know the story of Star Wars. Now, if I go and say Star Wars is actually star, you know, skiing, and Luke Skywalker is Bob Bobson and Darth Vader is, I don't know, Dirk Diggler or something, and then, um, you know, to try and get everyone to believe that that's the actual story of Star Wars and the other one never even existed would take an enormous amount of brutal suppression. So, so that's the wrong analogy, because that's not what happened. So over a period of, a long period, a century, you can see the story taking shape. This is many, many different people contributing. There is no deceit. No one's trying to pull the eyes, wool. It's not a conspiracy. It is simply people putting together a new mystery school or deepening an already existing mystery school. And what then happens, the real, the twist comes when those, when that tradition reaches the West, when it arrives in Rome and in Gaul. And you start getting for the very first time a new idea. 
Now, what, so what, I think what's, well, the reason for that is, is that whilst in the pagan tradition you get plays, like the plays around Dionysus and so forth, the, the Jewish tradition is to write histories. Now, they're not histories like we would understand histories. They're not actual histories. They're myths. And they, they, originally the Jesus story doesn't have any location. That's been added later. That's, that's, a, that's not our research. That's other scholars. But you can see that what's happened is that a basic narrative has come together with Sophianic wisdom sayings. And they've been mixed together. And then somebody has started putting it into a, na into a place. Whoever it was wasn't very good at geography, probably had hadn't never been, obviously, to Jerusalem and the, didn't understand it very well because it's not done very well. But they, it, it gives it a reality. It makes it, it gives it color. And, and part of the mysteries, which is you need to understand also, is that they have the outer mysteries and the inner mysteries. So the outer mysteries are about taking things literally. And I think that would have been just as true for the pagan mysteries. So whilst now we take it for granted that, well, there was no Dionysus, there was no really an, an Adonis or anything, I think for, the, for the, most of the people at the time, there would have been. They would have taken this completely seriously and the stories would have been real. Um, that's the world they lived in. And then when you came into the inner mysteries, you were ready. Uh, the teacher would sit you down and go, okay, this is really about you, your Dionysus. What you need to discover is the Dionysus in you. And this story that you've been following is actually a story of your own spiritual evolution. So that's what's happening the same with the Jesus mysteries. And this is all color for the outer mysteries. The story has got richness. When it hits the West, they lose the inner mysteries and it becomes literalized. And you get for the first time this really strong claim that, you know, this has only just happened. That's the other thing. All the other stories happen in mythic time. You don't know when they happen. But this was recent, relatively. Um, and the response is interesting because the pagan critics, and we're talking now the second century, start saying, hang on a second, you've just plag plagiarized our myths. You've just, you're saying the same as us. And the response of Christians like Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, who are the very first who will become Christianity as we now know it, Roman Christianity, their response isn't to deny that, because they can't. Their response is to say, yeah, but yours is just a myth, and ours really happened. And that's their selling point. It's, it's like the New Age, you know, you, you need a selling point, and that's theirs. But how can they say that when so many of the stories are the same? I mean, are they the same? The, 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 ah, the boys so, in the cave, so the, the light, there are, three shepherds, all of that kind of stuff? I mean, there's most of it. Their, their response is to make a virtue of it. So their whole thing is, Jesus came and actually lived this out. And I'll, I'll, people say that to me today. The, the difference is that he actually came and lived out the story. So that they were, the ancient myths and the pagan myths were prophecies or something like that? Well, for the Christians, they were diabolical prophecies. The devil, this is a, uh, this is, I forget, to be honest with you, Luke, whether it was Irenaeus or Justin Martyr, I'm pretty sure it was one of them, might have been Tertullian, who, who deals with exactly the issue you're talking about by saying what happened was the devil came, spread all these stories, so that when Jesus actually came, people would be confused. And that's the, it's diabolical mimicry. It's, it's, You've plagiarized it in advance. So, so, you know, there are many myths and stories out there. What, what's, why this one? What's so special about this resurrecting God-man story with the, you know, the, the 12 disciples and all of that stuff? Why, why, why is this one worthy of so much attention and energy and, and you know, worth killing people over for thousands of years? I mean, what, what? <laughs> I'm not sure it is worth killing people over for thousands of years. So the first bit is that, that, that when, the Rome, when the Roman church takes over this literalist form, you get the transformation into this, into what we, monotheism as we've come to see it, it becomes, it's a fascist empire and it takes it on for its own reasons and it uses it. And that's basically what the Catholic church. And then from that, the Protestant church has come, but it's all the same uh, it's the same books. So we now have, I mean, there were hundreds of Gospels. In fact, one of the complaints the literalists make about the Gnostics is that they say, oh, every, every one of them writes their own Gospel. Because you, you, you can't prove you're initiated unless you create your own myth. 
which is kind of sweet. So that's their approach, very different. So we now have many of these through a find at Nag Hammadi. We have a, quite a few Gnostic Gospels and we can see what they were saying and it's very different, including their whole cosmology, which involves a Christian goddess, and all of that as well. So the, what, we, what you can see there is that there's a completely, the, the Roman church has done, is the one that's been fighting about it. That's a different thing, really, or it's, it's a corrupted version of what was started off, I think, as a, a disparate attempt to explore the mysteries of life by buying some inquisitive minds with big hearts. So you were saying before that these mysteries that, of life, they are encoded in this myth. Okay, so why that myth? Okay, so I, I think it, the, 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 the motives develop which express certain ideas. So it's a bit like, I want you to get these certain ideas, so I build these motives in. So let's take one you mentioned, 12 disciples. That's a reference to the, the Zodiac. So a key idea in the ancient world for all of these people is everything is seen in the stars, as above, so below. The movement of the stars is reflected on the earth. And you've got to think, you know, there's this huge display going on above you. And the difference is here, everything's chaotic, but there everything is ordered and it follows this order. And then there's one point, the, the pole star, which doesn't move. So that's the Christ or the Dionysus. That's the center. It's your center. The whole mystery, you know, the whole, one, just to back up what I was saying earlier, the, the, one of the great lines I love is Paul, who's the earliest Christian writer we have and an, an agnostic in my view, the, the genuine Paul. There's, there's later fake letters of Paul. Um, his whole thing is, look, Christianity is about discovering the Christ in you. That's what it is. And that m myth of the Zodiac is going right. So Jesus is the center. That's your that's the Christ in you. And then the movement around the, it's the wheel of suffering in the East and in the West, it was called the wheel of grief. The Pythagoreans called it the wheel of grief. So you're caught on the wheel of grief in this cycle of suffering, which is reincarnation. And your job is to see that you were always still at the center, at which point you're off the wheel. So all of those teachings are then in that myth. And in one of the Gnostic gospels, you might've come across there's a lovely session where Jesus literally stands in the middle of a circle and the disciples go around and he, they sing together. And he says a line and they say a line back and he says a line and they're just playing out this, this myth. So and, and they're all doing that. I mean, another, another um, important motif here is the dying and the resurrection. Yes. Um, I, I watched this film, Zeitgeist, many years ago, and it talked about how it was a, a, something to do with the Southern Cross and uh, the, the, the sun, you know, on the winter solstice, something like that, and it was all about a solar deity. I mean, is that, what, what is the resurrecting God-man myth? Well, there's, there's lots of interpretations, and there's, there certainly is a lot of astrological stuff in there. We don't go into a huge amount of that. Uh, Zeitgeist got into a lot of trouble because everyone thought Peter and I had made the movie for a long time, which we didn't. I can announce publicly for the first time. Nothing to do with us because they used a lot of our material. But um, so look, yeah, there is astrological stuff. It's a bit like if you take a take a, a myth, another myth for a moment, if you take, which is also relevant because it's going to come up with the Christian goddess, which is the myth of Demeter and Persephone. So with the myth of Demetri and Persephone, you can inter interpret it on one level, and probably the first level that it arose at, it's about the seasons. Um, and lots of people will interpret that as a seasonal myth. It's about fertility. M later on, though, it starts to become a deeply allegorical spiritual myth, which is about the fall of the soul into incarnation, into Hades, which is, this is Hades, this is the land of shades, and returning to the mother and uh, the soul finding itself again. Now that's been developed, it's, it's evolved, and the same with the Jesus stuff. So I think it probably does have roots in um, astrological phenomena, but it becomes deeply mystical. And by the time it's, the, it's Gnostic, it really is interested in, you need to die to your, your lower self, your, what they call the eidolon, the image to the, what we might today call the ego, the, the, that, that thing where you just think it's all about me. And you need to wake up to the daemon or the spirit or the Christ in you, which is waking up to oneness. And that's the agape, the, this all embracing love. And that's your connection to God. So it's about, and, and that's a, again, a universal. You can go to Native Americans and you'll find them doing death and rebirth ceremonies. People, human beings have been doing that, I suspect, from Neolithic times.
Well, I mean, the, the Jesus myth, though, if it's really trying to teach us to, uh, you know, transcend the ego and become more awake to, to the wider connection between us and everything, um, it seems that the Jesus myth is maybe too sophisticated in terms of it, the way it's encoded these myths, because most people who read it don't get that. They get very simply the literal, you know, translation. It's, that, it's not designed for them to get it. This is the key thing to understand about the ancient world. They, they, these are not philosophical teachings. These are mythological motifs. So they're about something which you explore with your initiator. So you can, for people like Clement of Alexandra, for instance, will talk about this is the literal meaning, but this is the allegorical meaning. And so it is deliberately there. So the, uh, the outer mysteries relate to the myth of Adam. So Jesus dies for for the for the for the sins of the world all of those ideas but once you realize it's about you you are the one that's fallen you are the one who's fallen into sin sin a really important word it means it's hamartia in the greek it's it, it comes from archery and it means to miss the point so you you miss the the you miss the the target that's sin and uh, metanoia is is what what gets translated repentance, which means a change of heart or a change of direction. So it's all about look, you're missing the point. You need to change direction, and that's the whole sin and re repentance idea. And the the myths are, are 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 your way to understand what that might mean. So the big one, which where it's all going, there's lots of teachings about love in there, and you know, really, actually, I mean, full on teachings about love. And where it's going to go to is a mystical death and resurrection. Uh, and it is a resurrection. And the word that's used there, Anastasia, also means to awaken. So it's, a, it's coming to, an, to the gnosis, to the awakening. Gnosis means knowledge. And, and that's why they're called Gnostics, because they're interested in, in gnosis. Well, um, this, this thing about having, you know, trying to access these inner mysteries, with, it's done with a sort of mentor who's spiritually guiding you in. It seems like that's quite a big, large barrier to entry, and it seems quite opposite to the way that the Roman church um, had a fervor to convert everybody and get everybody into this religion. It seems almost like let's not let them into the religion. That was the original Christianity. No, it's not that. It's just that the, 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 the it's modeled after the mysteries. I mean, and the and the texts, the early texts, use the language of the of the pagan mysteries. So the the system of the mysteries was you had an outer mysteries, you had inner mysteries, and literally the outer one is is about how you behave in the world. So the first thing is you know, hey, learn to be a good person, and then okay, now you can understand the mystical stuff, which is transpersonal. Now it's about discovering God, finding out the part of you that is one with God. And that's that's above the it's it's above the psyche or the soul. Psyche is the Greek word for soul. So in the uh, pagan and the uh, Jesus mysteries, you get these two levels of initiation. The first one is the psychic initiation, and the second is the pneumatic. Psychic just means soul. So the first one's the soul initiation, and pneumatic means spirit. It's the spirit initiation. So the first one is all about your your individual soul. And, and you get all the do unto others as you would be done by and, you know, let, turn the other cheek and all the moral teachings. But that leads to, and in the myth that happens. So Jesus is, you know, he's giving the teachings, he's doing really well, but, and that's going to lead him to arriving in Jerusalem. He comes in on the donkey. The donkey in the myth is Set. Uh, it's the, the lower self. Set is the Egyptian god donkey god and so he's mastered his lower self so he's completed the psychic initiation he's 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 the man and he's hailed as the king hallelujah and everyone is welcomes him in it's a moment of triumph for him and then everything's going to turn around and he's going to be betrayed and, and it's going to go horribly wrong and he's going to die a horrible death and he's going to do it willingly and that is suddenly in, in you know grotesque imagery which i wouldn't use today if i was sharing these ideas but they lived in a pretty brutal world. You get this deep confronting teaching about death and rebirth. But worth, you know, it's like the Gnostics do it differently too, because they have a tradition of that's called the laughing Jesus. So in one of the Gnostic texts, Jesus is on the cross dying, but his spirit, the real Jesus, is in a cave of light, laughing, saying, I seem to suffer, but I don't suffer. 
because I distinguish what I appear to be from what I am. And what you've got there is a very confronting teaching. And I, again, I don't think it's something I'd use today because we moved on, but it's very much got that stoic philosophy. It's like life is really, really hard. And the true philosopher, the philosophia, the lover of Sophia, Sophia is the goddess of wisdom. The true philosopher can even stay true in the worst possible situation. So what do they do? They put the hero, the archetypal initiate, through the worst possible thing. He's betrayed by his friends, he's hung up to death, and he transcends that, he comes through. And then when he, wait, he comes out, so he's born in a cave. There's a lovely line, if you want to get it really, you go to one of the critics of Christianity, who's uh, Plotinus, the Neoplatonist, and he, his basic thing with Christianity is, it, it, like you're saying, it's too complicated. Oh, you know, it's like, we, Plato, we, we Platonists, we, we've got away from the myths now, and we're into philosophy, but you've just re-mythologized the whole thing, which is what they've done. Uh, but he says, basically, it's the same as our myth. It's the myth of the ascent from the cave, which, I mean, you know, who goes to Sunday school and they go, yeah, it's the ascent from the cave. We don't. But it is. It's actually the movement from the cave at the beginning, who he's born in, we, we got stable, but it's a cave, and the cave at the end, where he resurrects and it's empty. And that, that is the myth. And the, the, the cave, to anyone in the ancient world, you'd know that the cave is Plato's cave, or really Pythagoras' cave, which is the universe. So you, you're born into the universe, and then he ascends from the universe. And in one of his letters, Paul says he's conquered the cosmos. He's come out. So, I mean, what you're describing sounds to me a bit like the Gnosis. I mean, so so the the this whole Jesus myth, we have two takes on it. We've got the Roman Christian take and the Gnostic take. And the, yeah. the Roman Christian take is that um, Jesus is our salvation. It's all about salvation. And we get our salvation through believing in him. Yeah. And then we go to heaven and everything's great. And yeah. the Gnostic myth seems to be that we have to have Gnosis and by that way we're saved. Um, but, you know, with it being too complicated, of course, billions of Christians through history have never got that. They've never got the gnosis side of things. So um, is that is that the, the, the essential gnosis? Is that is that what we've all been searching for? You know, this, I, this word gnosis is new to a lot of people, I think. Yeah. I guess, yes, it means knowledge or, or wisdom or whatever. Um, but but it, is that basically it, that you are Jesus and you are going through this uh, story of life that's sometimes hard and sometimes challenging and ultimately you've got to transcend ego. I mean, but is that it? Look, no, I think, I think, the, I think the, the, the version of Christianity which is still around today has had a, a huge, I mean, it's done horrible things, mainly through organized religion, but individually it's created most of what is good in Western culture. It, it's been, and still today, it, it opens people's hearts, people find meaning. It's a beautiful thing. Anything, you know, is there, is there a greater line ever written than love your enemies? What a thing to say. I mean, love your enemies is right at the center of the religion which has dominated our culture. So of course, everything that's best has come from it. So that's all good. It's just only the outer mysteries. And the reason that a lot of people in my generation went to India when looking for spirituality is they still had the inner mysteries but we had them originally i just didn't know that and they were lost along the way not everyone lost them there's still great christian mystics loads of them you know meister eckhart st john of the cross teresa of avila you know these are they discovered it all through it they, they found out and actually if you go into any church up and down the country you will find them interpreting the myths every sunday well, not at the moment because we can't go to get, get together, but normally. So, you know, if someone tells the story of turning water into wine at the wedding, you can bet the bottom dollar, listen to Radio 4 when they're doing the God spot, and they'll be like, and what this means is you need to take your life and change it from something ordinary into something wonderful and ecstatic. Or Everyone does that because that's what it's designed for. So, so really, I think oh, we just lost the inner mysteries or it, they were, we lost the structure which allowed them to flourish. But they're still there. And then that is literally the inner work, which then goes, there's, you know, it's beautiful, the, the idea that someone did it for you. But the, when you're ready, you go, no, no, it's about you. You need to do this. You need to make the journey. 
and you're ready now. And that will lead you to not believing in God, but knowing God. And that's a completely different thing. Well, I'd like to, to, to go into how to really do that yourself. But, but before we do, um, uh, there's, you know, there's so much information about the, the Gnostics and, and, and this kind of alternative view to this whole uh, uh, Christian myth. Well, uh, alternative, I don't know if it's alternative, I suppose it's just a deeper view of the, of the myth. But, but um, they, they have a very contrasting view um, in some ways. So, so as I understand it, they, they believe that this whole idea of God, you know, Yahweh presented in the Bible, was actually a bad guy. Am, am I right about that? Like, so, for example, the, the, yes, garden, the, the Garden of Eden story with, um, you know, he, want, he, he lies to them, he says they're going to die and then don't eat the tree of knowledge and the snake is a good guy. I mean, uh, what's, what's going on there? Is, is, is the Christian God a good guy or a bad guy, according to the Gnostics? Or, or? The Christian God is a good guy, but Yahweh is not a good guy. Um, at least for some of the Gnostics, quite a few. So they're wrestling. It, everything evolves throughout history. And you can see the mysteries are evolving. So you've got, when you synth, what the Jews did, what the Jewish Gnostics did, was the same that people like me do now. They synthesized what they had available. I got this and I got this. How does this fit together? I'm, I'm, my latest work is all about that. It's eclectic. And the ancient world had one language, Greek, and it was eclectic, especially in places like Alexandria, where you literally had everything going on. So you've got a problem now. How do you fit together your texts with this new information or this other information which you want to integrate? And one way they did that was to look at it and, and think, well, it's, they were after the God of Plato, the one, the good. Yahweh's not that. He's a jealous, jealous God. He, 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 he's a punishing God. He's a, and they're also having an experience of life that life is hard. I mean, life is, entails for us now, but then, I mean, really, really. Full of suffering constantly all the time. Even when things are great, I'm sure Bill Gates suffers. I, absolutely. And, and you can imagine, I mean, maybe we can't imagine what it was like to live in the ancient world where life was cheap and you know, there were no dentists, you know, it's like sent suffering everywhere. So they saw this as flawed. Now, I don't myself, but at that point in history, they did. And so they looked at Yahweh. In fact, they took not just Yahweh, but they took all of the heroes of the Old Testament and turned them into villains. And the people who stood up to them were the Gnostic heroes. So the snake was Jesus trying to, because they want them to take the, 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 the apple of, of knowledge. Of knowing good and evil. So, so in their view, is is the, this world a creation of God, or is it a creation of of, of uh, Yahweh? Of okay, so they have a complex um, metaphysics of emanation, which starts with the true God, and then, in a way, very much like Kabbalah, which all, Kabbalah is really like what happened to Jewish Gnosticism that didn't didn't become Christianity. They're very similar, I think, to the Jewish Gnosticism. It splits and uh, but it's, you get the same idea of this emanation and so things split into pairs syzygies they're called and it kind of falls down from the pristine into the base so it starts with pure spirit and ends up with matter it's like the opposite of what we believe now with evolution so it kind of goes blah, 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 blah. and the last uh, bit that creates the world in their metaphysical mythology is done by uh, Sophia, the goddess Sophia, has a child who is Yahweh, or the demiurge of the creator, and he is full of himself and thinks he can create a world and messes it up. That's one of the kind of quick ways through it. And that's the one we're living in. And that's the one we're living in. So the job is to get free from Yahweh and to get back to the true God of love. Because they look at Yahweh, and what they're really doing, I think what, I think what, what Jung would see in this, because he was fascinated with the Gnostics, is that what's happening psychologically in the soul is that they are wrestling with getting beyond the God of justice to the, you know, who's going to punish you and re reward you, to the God of love, which is about redemption. And psychologically, that is a gigantic leap forward and has huge impl implications for everything that will happen right across the world, actually. You know, you've got to look at someone like Mahatma Gandhi, who changed the world in, our, in the last century, but took it from Christianity, took it from this love-based religion, 
which emerged by going, we don't want the God of justice. We want the God of love and forgiveness. And that's a huge jump. Can you feel it in yourself, that jump between what's right and what's wrong? And, you know, duh, that's not fair. Or, you know, to turn the other cheek, to I forgive you 70 times, 70 times, to I will die although I'm innocent. Uh, I will forgive those who, who wrong me, who kill me. You know, these are, this is a huge psychological jump and it lays the ground for the next 2,000 years of our evolution. Well, that's the thing. The Christian religion was based on foundations of love and forgiveness and goodness. And yet the reality of its adoption into Western culture was one of, I mean, we had, we had great spiritual traditions, pagan traditions. And then as soon as Christianity came in, we went and entered the dark ages. You know, it was the real fall from Eden, I suppose. I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that Rome before it was Eden. You know, it was also pretty dark. I mean, you know, the Roman Empire was an ancient, a empire in the ancient world. It was you know, a brutal, it was you know, basically about tax farming and it was brutal. Uh, but it, 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 through quirks of history, I think in many ways, I mean, it, the, the, the religion of the empire almost became Mithraism, which is a different version from Persia. Um, but it became Christianity from, you know, how odd is that? And I, I think very possibly just by the quirk that a lot of the widows in Rome got into it, and one of them was Constantine's mother. And he was looking for a religion to unite the empire, and he was looking to impose it now. He needed unity at all costs, and literally you know, got together the Council of Nicaea and forced unity. So, so the whole exterminating of Cathars and Gnostics through, through all of this time, through the Dark mm -hmm. Ages, was that just about unity for the Roman Empire? Is that, is that... Well, the Roman Empire as an empire died, but as, as, as um, you know, in the rise and fall of the, the Roman Empire, you know, the famous book, you know, it sees it as continuing right the way through to the 16th century, actually. So it does continue in a different form. It's still dominating everywhere until Henry VIII here, for instance. And, and, and that's power. And a lot of the people who are popes and we know, are, you know, are, are the worst, very worst sort of people during the, all of that period. So there's two sides to it. There's a power religion, and then there's this, inside it, there's something beautiful trying to get free all the time. I mean, that, that's the thing is that, you, I think you described it in the book as a power crazed cult spreading guilt and fear. And yet what they're really spreading is, is a myth of love and forgiveness. Yeah. I suppose the people I know who, who count themselves a Christian are loving and forgiving. Yeah, exactly. And, and I'm sure it had that effect on lots and lots of people during that, during that whole period. And, and it is a cult. And cults work generally anyway. They're, they're, you know, they have a dark element, which makes them what they are. But there's usually good things in them, which is why people are attracted. And Christianity historically has been like that. But it's kept evolving. I mean, it hasn't stayed still. It's still moving. Well, now, now we're in a, an age, actually it's an astrological age, we're in the, the end of the age of Pisces, which, That's right. which represents astrologically organized religion, and we're entering the age of Aquarius, and, and uh, things are changing, and Christianity, of course, is losing its relevance, and, but, but what seems to be replacing it um, is uh, you know, scientism that, that, that's the, in vogue at the moment, which um, you know, says that the only real meaning to life is to accumulate wealth and not much else. Um, and so, so I think there's a kind of spiritual hole in people that used to be served by Christianity and isn't anymore. So, so um, wh what is it that we can do to, to uh, I, I guess, you know, you're talking about the inner mysteries, the getting connected to your true purpose in life and understanding uh, your your connection to everything. Uh, you know, how do we how do we start uh, doing that? What can we take away from the Jesus myth to get there? How, how do we how do we how do we become more spiritually connected uh, to the whole? If that's really what Christianity was teaching, and that's what's uh... so the work on G on on Christianity that I did with with my dear friend Peter Gandhi was twenty years ago, and a little bit after that. You know, there was a lot of pressure on me to stick with that because the book was an international bestseller, which is like, ah, like, oh, you, you're the Jesus man. But very quickly, I looked at it and I thought, you know, you could spend a lifetime just talking about this. But actually what's important is not to write about the Gnostics, but to do what the Gnostics did. And what the Gnostics did was they took this ancient evolving Gnosis and they turned it into something new for their time. 
And it was something so creative that it's still with us. So what's been my preoccupation for the last 20 years is how can we, there's something in this, you know, which I've explored experientially, you know, the gnosis is real, it's life-changing. How can we, these old myths are not going to do it anymore. It's what they do for some people. But increasingly, the scientism has been the deconstruction of the myths. We've done that in the Jesus story. It's like, oh, these are myths. So what would it be today? How can we come up with something which is what I would call trans-scientific? So the scientific has taken us forward because it's gone clear your head. <laughs> the world wasn't created 4,000 years ago. There was no one who came back from the dead. This is all mumbo jumbo. Let's look at the evidence and suddenly we've got the internet and we can fly and go to the moon. Unbelievable. But we've lost the inner mysteries again. We've lost the, the meaning of existence. So what I'm interested in is, okay, I've spent my life exploring that in all of these different spiritual traditions. How can we find that again today and understand it alongside science? Not instead of it, but alongside it. And then maybe science, scientism, can grow into a trans-scientific spirituality, which includes all of that on its own terms, not with quantum mumbo jumbo and all the, there's a lot of nonsense in my view being done but with, some, with, with something which genuinely does that, but brings back in the essence of what's still there. But it will need changing, just like they had to go back and go, oh, these people in the past that were heroes, we now don't see them like that. Yahweh we saw as God, now we, we transcend that. We have to do the same. We have to move spirituality on. And we're going, as you said, we're going into a new great age, which is interesting. The age of Pisces has been dominated by Christianity. I think that we're, that we're in for a completely new stage now. And I don't think we'll stay with scientism because it doesn't. It only it only addresses half of reality. It's very good at that, though. It deserves a huge amount of respect, and it's brought in more compassion as well. That's the other thing. It's not just all been, you know, hard nosed mathematics or something. I mean, what I love about science is it, it is that it, it the world before that was a world still dominated by the justice idea, really. So if a child dies. God wanted the child to die, and you're being punished, or you show karma, or you know, someone, you've got a deformed member of the family, and it reflects badly on them and on you. And then science came in and just went, oh no, that's, that's not like that at all. No, no, we should take care of everybody. And we should find out the causes of these things, and we should change them, we should heal them and get them right. And what do you know? Well, you're talking about, a, 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 forgive me if I, mangling the words, transcendental, new science and spirituality mixed together. Yeah, so I call it trans-scientific. Um, often people call it trans-rational, um, but I think that's confusing uh, because it, 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 what I'm, by trans-scientific, I just mean that, that Ken Wilber, the philosopher, has this lovely phrase about transcending and including. So going beyond, but not losing the thing you've gone beyond. So I think we need to do, go beyond science and understand the deeper levels or the, 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 the soul levels of reality, but, but based on science. So what does that really mean then? Okay, so, so I'm you know, listening to you now, all these people listening to this interview. What does that really mean in practice? What do I mm -hmm. do? Go and meditate in a forest and then and, and recognize that the tree has roots that talk in my verbal networks? I mean, what, is, what does it really mean to, 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 to do as you're saying? Okay, so there's two things. One is the, the question, what do you do? to get this, and then there's what's the understanding which underpins that. So I'll just say very, very, very briefly the outline of the understanding, and that can lead into what you can do. So the big change, the, the big idea, I think, in science was, is less than 100 years old, which is we are, the universe isn't a thing, it's a process. Monumental idea. Everything has evolved. We're in a 14 billion year process of evolution. I mean, it's just a huge idea, and it, everything seems to bear it out. This turns around the ancient spiritual idea. The spiritual idea is it's all perfect, and then we fall down into this shithole, and we need to get out. This idea is, no, no, no. It's been slowly evolving, and that's why it was bad, and now it's getting better, and we, must, we are that process. And that process has gone from uh, the development of the material world 
to, uh, on this particular planet at least, the evolution of life from the simplest of form to the massive ecologies we have today, including human beings, and then in the human form and some other forms as well, you've got the development of the psyche. Now the word psyche is the ancient word that the Gnostics used. They were All their teachings were about the psyche. It means soul. So the process of evolution, it's not controversial, has gone from matter to the soul. That's a what every scientist would agree with that. What, what, in, in what way? You mean we started with a Big Bang and had an element of hydrogen and it turned into humans yeah. that have souls? I mean, well, yeah, well, that's exactly what's happened. You know, I mean, now, how you understand the psyche, of course, that's up for grabs. But what we've got is the, the story that science tells is exactly that. You know, 13.8 billion years ago, there was nothing but hydrogen and a bit of helium. Now it's having a conversation about itself right now. That's what's happened. We are the universe having a conversation about what the hell the universe is. We're trying to discover who we are. That's huge. So then, and then what I think what, what science does is it cuts it off at biology because it is often based on a reductionist idea that what really exists is what you can measure with the senses. Whereas clearly what exists is greater than that. Because the very idea that expresses that belief, you can't see it with the senses. You can't see E equals MC squared with the senses. These are ideas. Ideas exist. And ideas are not made of matter. Have a look. You're experiencing them right now in the psyche. Everyone is. So what I'm saying to science is don't stop. There's a whole imaginal level of reality which has evolved. And the imaginal level of reality is the very thing that spirituality has always been concerned with from earliest shamanic times. And we can re-understand that body of spiritual knowledge in a new way as part of one evolutionary process. And then with spirituality, I'm saying, don't imagine that that existed forever. It's evolved. Everything has evolved. And then to, to, to go right back to the beginning and just go, so... One of the things, again, you see this in Gnosticism, they have this idea of the pneuma, the spirit. Uh, spirit means essence, essence, essay, to be, it's Latin. It's being. And I look at the, that's, that's what we're discovering, our being. And then I look at the evolutionary story and I go, well, if all of this is evolving qualities, if, 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 if and it's happening now, every moment is new, 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 new. It's one flow of evolution, which has taken us from hydrogen to you and me. What's the simplest quality that it's, that it's come from? And I think, well, what's the quality that everything has? It has the quality of being. So maybe we can understand this thing that we're in right now in a new Gnostic way as the evolution of being. Being in a process of becoming, to use words that Plato used. So that being is the essence or the spirit which is becoming everything. So that if we then become conscious of our being, which is the, what Gnosticism has always been about, you discover, oh, my being is the same being as the universe. And that's the essence of Gnosticism. You discover that your spirit is one with the spirit, or in, indeed in the East, your Atman is one with Brahman. It's the same teaching everywhere. But then what do you do with that? Okay, so... so I'm not a separate individual Luke. I am part of the totality and we are one spirit altogether. Okay, great. So, so what? What does that change? What do I do? How do I, how does that change the way I live my life? What do I do? Well, I think it changes just about everything um, in my experience. So the first thing is, it's not just a kind of like, oh, okay, mm, that's an interesting idea. If you go into it, it's a full on experience. That's why it's the gnosis. You know something. And it's also agape, it's love. And it's not limited love, like my love for my daughter or my wife or my friends. It's a universal, all-embracing love. Because love is how oneness feels. So you feel one with somebody or you commune with another person or another soul, you feel that connection and we, that's, that's what we mean by love, I think. And then you suddenly feel it for everything and everyone. And that is this, that's why you can love your enemies. That's what the teaching is about. It's like there is a love so big, it even includes your enemies. So that's the first thing. 
you become the, the word I've started using uh, is is that we're evolving from individuals to univigils. I think that's the next step of our evolution that's got us from hydrogen to here hasn't finished. The next step is that human beings are waking up to being one with the universe. So from individual to univigil. And the Gnostics, and not just the Gnostics, obviously the people who wrote the Upanishads and all of them, were the small group of precursors for this thing which was going to just take off slowly, slowly and underground and is now beginning to, it's, it's come above ground. Now it's sprouting above the ground. And suddenly lots of people are getting intimations of, I had an experience of oneness. I mean, when I used to teach about oneness 20 years ago, no one knew what I meant. Now, if I say we're all one, most people know what I mean. Many people have experienced it. And then you start living a different life because you're living from connection. You're living from love. You're, you're, this, and you're living a life full of meaning. You look at the universe. It's like, wow, I am the universe exploring itself. Okay, so I recognize this idea as probably true. I try and hold it. And yet at the same time, um, what, though I recognize myself as part of everything and I have a sometimes a total love of everything. I think you've called it big love in, in one of your- I have, I listen, and, I love. Uh, 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 you know, th this, this sort of deep awake state, I think you yep. call it as well, which is, yep. the, which is the, the awareness of um, my oneness with everything yep. um, and my love for it. Uh, and yet I'll go outside, someone will cut me off in tra traffic, I'll get bloody angry. And, um, and again, I feel disconnected and separate. Yep. Um, and, and you know, just looking around the world around us, things are pretty much falling apart. They're, they're not, uh, we're not, you don't go outside and see people hugging each other and loving the trees and everything. You see people cutting them down, and beating each other up. So, I mean, well, there's both, but. So, so here's the first thing. I think, with respect, that you are completely wrong about the state of the world. God knows there is so much that needs to be better, but there is a massive misconception about the state of the world. And, and one of the things which I point to a lot is uh, the work of people like uh, Hans Rosling um, and, and others, which absolutely clearly show that on, on every metric that we have focused on, so poverty or child mortality, length of life, basic wealth, there has been such a profound betterment for everyone. We don't even notice it. And also there's been a huge growth of compassion with that, much bigger than ever before in history. I wish people understood history more because I think they'd see where we are now much kinder. Because it's easy to look at things and oneself as well and think, oh, it's terrible because there's plenty to complain about. But it's also important to look and just go, wow, this is incredible what we've done that actually it didn't occur to me once when I had kids that they might die. They might, of course, but it was unlikely. None of them, I didn't know it. I don't know anyone whose kids have died. But go back a little way and you would expect to lose most of your kids. Not long, right? Yeah, not long. And that's just with everything. These are, these are huge, huge steps forward which have happened. And so alongside that, I think this individuality, or the, the, gr the group of people who are having the gnosis is still pretty small, even those that are trying or had it once. But the group of people who care about people on the other side of the planet is huge. You know, people will give their time, their money. People, you know, when we had the last big war in Iraq, people came out to try and prevent that war all over the world. It didn't work, but when else would, other, when else would you come out caring about people in another country you'd never meet? Okay. These are, these are huge. So, so you are absolutely right. Things are way better than they used to be. And yet at the same time, things are worse. Um, if, for example, uh, you know, I, I often feel that we're facing the eschaton in terms of, you know, the, the, the planetary systems are breaking down, that the ice caps melting, we're facing a blue ocean event possibly this year. Okay. So what you've got, it seems to me, is the same thing that's happened throughout history. And, you know, this is, I mean, obviously it's happening on a larger scale now, which is that in solving one problem, just like we do in our own lives, we, we inadvertently create other problems and then we have to solve them. And what we've seen in my lifetime over the last few decades and the work I did around environment when I was younger was about waking up to, oh, we've now got another serious problem. So all of these things have got better. This has got worse. And you're absolutely right. 
So now what we need to do is bring that same level of commitment and compassion. And one of the things that will help that is when you realize we're not separate from nature. And that's what the one this is about. That's, that's the same message. Oh, look, we're not, we're not separate from nature. We are nature. Now, we have to be careful with that. Because what I see happening often with green thinkers, of which I would have counted myself probably, and maybe I still am, I don't know, but is there's a kind of almost like a misanthropy that comes in. Human beings are like a plague that are destroying nature. It's like, no, we are nature. And we are nature doing what nature wanted to do. We're really successful. That's what nature is wants in every form. It's just that we have done it so well. And now, and, but we're, we're, we've got this special thing, which is why we've been so powerful. We have the thing, we have the psyche. Other animals have psyches too, of course, but we have it big. That's what we've specialized in. And it's, so that means we can imagine and create. So now we have to use that in a new way. And we have to, we have to use it in a connected way, not as a way of, I want to benefit me, my tribe, my, which is all of that accumulate, accumulate. And that's been the last phase. Now we need to transcend that and, and have a completely come from, uh, we need to find the, the connection and the love that comes from it. And then we need to find new wisdom. And we're doing that. We are doing that. It's happening. We need to do it fast. But we, it's happening. Well, that's the thing. We do need to do it fast. So, so okay. Absolutely, we want Trump and everyone, Boris Johnson, all these people have transcendental experiences and realize their deep connection to the planet and, and make everything better. But that's 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 later. In the meantime, <laughs> how do we do that ourselves? How, how do you how do you get to this state of deep awake? This this state of uh, yeah. uh, uh, individual. Um, Univigil. Univigil, sorry. That's all right. It's um, new word. How, how do we get to the state of univigility uh, within ourselves? I yeah. Mean, what, what, what do I do today, tomorrow, to, to, to feel that? And, and not just feel it, but hold on to it and keep that as my perspective of reality rather than just a momentary yeah. uh, ascension. So the first thing is it's really good to have a powerful experience of it. Because once you've had it, a powerful experience once, you, it's like you know. So when we could get together, obviously we have a new problem right now, um, I would run these events called Deep Awakenings where I would do everything in my power to help people have that experience and often, very often, most people did. And what I was using there was meditation but also connection. So I found that because we are, there is one of us, if you connect people together, so if I look at you, you know, if I, if I play beautiful music, because music's magic, it's from the imagination, and we connect, and I look, and I realize, hey, this is interesting, I'm looking at your, there's a beautiful face, there's your eyes, but what I'm connecting with is your soul, your psyche. And I can't see that, but there we're connected. The, the psyche, which is non-local, is connecting with psyche, it's happening all the time. And that changes things, and then you go deeper, and you get to a place where the universe is looking at itself, or the one, the oneness of being is looking at itself. And that's a really powerful experience, and you, you feel it through the love. That is key, that's one part of it. Then there's the returning to it. Well, I think there's, again, it's about learning where to put your attention. So you can do it in a million ways, actually, but a simple way is you just become aware of your being that is one with all being. And if you practice that and you learn how to do it it's like oh well, well teach me how do you do that okay so if you if you can i mean this is something you need to spend a bit more time with but if you're aware now of the being of your body say and the being of your psyche they exist and then you extend that out and you go oh well, hang on I, I, there's the being of the air i'm breathing there's the being of the chair i'm sitting on there's the being of the room we're in there's the being of the whole planet there's the being of the whole universe and you're immersed in that oneness of being because you are that oneness of being arising as these qualities. And so the whole of the of reality is the one in relationship to itself. But then, but then as you're saying these words, I'm also feeling the separation. I'm, I'm here, but then there's sofa is, I'm on it. I'm, so the, I'm so not the, the sofa. So exactly. So the key thing with that is, is to get one, that last thing. It's like it's, when, you, when you're looking for it as the oneness, it can be hard to find. But when you get the, the one is also two. The one is in relationship with itself. Every form it has taken is in relationship with the whole. And Luke is one and Tim is one. So Tim is unique. He is an individual. That's important. And so are you. I think that's, I'm not, I'm not of the school that, that, that tries to decry the individual. I want to hold the individual up. I think the individual is, I think the whole of evolution has led to the individual. And 
But through that, you can go, yeah, but I am, I am the universe as this individual relating to the universe. And then suddenly there's a communion with everything. You're no longer just separate from it. You are both the individual and you have a universal nature as well. And if you spend some time with it, and that, again, it's like the inner mysteries, you know, one of the roles of people like me who've got old is to go, okay, so I've spent a lot of time doing this. I can, I can maybe help you do it and pass it on so that the next generation can be better at it. And we keep passing it on. It's a long-term, you know, the, the, the awakening of our individuality. I don't know how quickly that can happen. I'm not, I'm not expecting it to happen overnight. I think it'll be, I think it'll be, it may, it may even be the, ne the thing which marks out the whole of the next phase, like the next 2,000 years. Do you think it can happen in time, in, in terms of, like I said, the ocean event, we got all these planetary problems, uh, we, we need to solve this stuff quickly, we need to start recognizing how important nature is and our connection with it and how we are nature and all of this stuff. Yep. Uh, do you think we're, we're going to make it in that sense? I don't, I, don't, I don't think we have to, you know, if we were waiting for everyone to realize that they were God, you know, for all that happens, we may be waiting a long time. But um, I do, I, I, I have a, I have an evolutionary optimism because we've come this far and because we are very smart and that there's a lot of goodness in the world. Just about everyone I meet is a good person. So the good people way, way, way outnumber the people who are really caught in themselves. But the people who are really caught in themselves can do a lot of damage. Um, and we can all do a lot of damage when we're unconscious in a system. So we need to, what we need to do is empower each other. So really it's not about like, can we arrive at this thing and then we'll solve it? It's more like, can we understand what we're in? And or, I mean, even just, can we wake up and just not be like this? Like, duh, duh, duh. can we actually look, you know, it goes on forever in every direction. It's, you're alive uh, <laughs> and only for a short time. So what really matters? And what is it for you that really matters? What's your contribution to this big adventure? And how can you evolve? And not expecting yourself to remember all the time or be perfect, because things which are perfect don't evolve. It's only things which are imperfect that evolve. So, we're, so to actually enter into an evolutionary journey, which includes waking up to oneness and the love that comes from it, and then bringing that into the world in whatever unique way, like what you're doing or the things I try to do with books or whatever it is. But, you know, one, one question that strikes me is, is, is uh, you know, what we're doing here is essentially we're trying to be happy and... Um, Are we? <sighs> Are we? I, I'm not trying to be happy. I like being happy. Hmm. I think, that's, I think that's, the, that's the myth of materialism because happiness actually is a reaction to something new that's good. I think that's when you feel happy, which is why when you get a new car, you feel happy. But then after a few weeks, you don't. So they need something else, because then the new thing will make you feel happy again. Because it's a reaction to something new that makes you feel like, oh, something. That's, 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 that's just part of that, that circle that just keeps you rolling. I think we're looking for something far deeper than happiness. What is it we're looking for? Then? I think we're evolving into God. I think we're, we are the universe seeking its most emergent form. And the, the big change that I would make to the traditional mythos, which is much more optimistic, is I don't think it starts with God and then we all fall away and get trapped and need to get home. I think the universe is evolving into God, by which I mean what it started with the simplest of things, being, I think. And it's evolving into the most emergent. And the most emergent thing I can imagine is the universe conscious of itself. And so I think as we wake up to oneness, we are giving birth to something beyond ourselves, which is why right from the Gnostic days, when you enter the Gnosis, you feel like you're in communion with something greater than yourself, because you are. And that thing which is greater than you can get called God, although it's a difficult word. So it's, it's something transcendent, and it's marked out as it's totally benign, and it's love. So they discovered that, go, that, that God that was the God of love beyond the, the judgmental Yahweh. And I think that's been growing. It's growing, and I experience it. So I think what we're doing is we're growing into that, so that the universe is flowering into God. 
However, while it's doing that, we are all individual slices of that one universe. We are. And, and, and so we should be. And, and as this individual slice, um, it seems like perhaps my life would be a lot easier if I just decided not to be conscious of that, carried on playing video games and watched movies all the time and, and, and just, you know, just yeah, bugger it. Red pill or blue pill, whichever one yeah. it is in the Matrix. Yeah, yeah. Um, what, why, why should I want to wake up to individual, sorry, uni individuality? <laughs> yeah, damn good question. Um, which pill is it? Do you have it? Because I might, I mean, I'd, <laughs> if I could go back. Um, Look, yeah, I think to enter into the, this is another big change for me with, certainly with the spirituality which is prevalent, the kind of consumer spirituality, American spirituality mainly, which is very prevalent now. The kind of individualistic. You know, individualism has been great. We just need to go the next step. <laughs> Uh, it, it's all about that happiness. It's all about what's in it for me. And what is in it for you? Well, struggle, partly. Also, moments of sublime meaning and um, tons of meaning, actually. The meaning is what exists in both the struggle and the sublime moments of the love and the awakening. And you, you feel touched by the numinous God comes and lifts you up. And, it's, and then you're not. And then it's like you're working on yourself or you're working on changing the world in some way or bringing something into the world and I mean I know with what I do which is around ideas and philosophy trying to get to the fundamentals it's really hard and there's long periods where I feel quite lost where it can feel like it's all falling to bits on me and then bang it takes off again and but I've got old enough now to know that process and I just go okay I want this I want I, I don't want that spirituality which marks out the previous period which is about escape this is a bad place, escape. And the way to escape is to get rid of your humanity. Don't have desires, don't feel anything. Give up thoughts as well for that matter. Stop being a human being and disengage with the body and you can go back and... Whereas this spirituality that I'm interested in, this evolutionary spirituality, is the opposite. It's like, no, engage with your humanity in the world. That's what, it's been leading to that. That's not a mistake. That's where it's been leading to. It just needs to go another step. And the step doesn't diminish the humanity. It completes it. It transcends it. You become something because you become something, become part of something bigger than yourself. And you start serving the thing that's bigger than yourself. So, so on this journey to become um, uh, more, more um, serving something bigger than yourself, a journey of becoming kind of, I don't know what the word is, uh, an aware individual who's, who's serving creation and the evolution of humanity. Um, what, <laughs> Very nice. Okay. Well, one of the, one of the tools that, that's, that's helped me along that process has been synchronicity. Um, and I've noticed when I've, when I've taken choices that have led me to be more unconscious, for example, play more video games and watch more movies and, and forget about a, a deeper purpose or a deeper meaning, um, the synchronicities dry up. And yet when I, when I take um, steps to serve the evolution of all, um, synchronicities start abounding. Um, so, so for people who want to uh, serve um, uh, evolution I suppose uh, how do we how do we uh, work with synchronicity and how do we how do we uh, interpret what on earth these weird coincidences are how do we use them to help uh, our evolution as, as, as humans? well first of all I think video games and films are great <laughs> and there's a place for video you know it's like when you've when I've run a retreat I just want to sit down and play a video game or watch football or just chill out. And that's fine. So it's all about, you know, there's room for everything in life. It's not like, I don't think we've got to become kind of like, yes, I'm just thinking about the evolution of the planet. It's like, oh, just, you know, enjoy it. But there's all, but this element is always there. And it's a, and then, then the synchronicity is interesting, isn't it? So one of the things I want to do with a trans-scientific spirituality is I want to go, look, I experience life. My experience has, has been full of magic really incredible things synchronicities all sorts of stuff which doesn't seem to have a place within the, with the world described by physics but physics really works and it's impressive so how can it be that i live in a world which is both seems to be cause and effect and also like a dream which is it and my sense is it's both 
my, and what I'm playing with is that as these different levels have evolved, that life has evolved into a dream. And that's what I'm experiencing now. So I look at this level of the psyche and it's, it's a dream. And I look at this level and it's physics. I drop something, it's going to fall. And they're all coexisting. It's just that I don't think the psyche, and, the, and, and I see the psyche as a whole, an ecology of soul, a whole ecology of, of, of psyche, not just like my little bubble, but connected to what Jung called the collective. I think that world is one of, which is held together by meaning and narrative. It's a story. So the universe has evolved into a story, like a video game. It's like on the basis of the video game, it's ones and zeros. But by the time you're playing it, it's a story. And like the whole universe is like that. You come back to the basics, it's pretty, pretty, you know, it's ones and zeros, literally, actually. And then you come up and, oh, it's what happened here. The first thing we did, we just explored the story of Tim and Luke. Oh, how's your story? Oh, huh, nice to tell me about your story. And that's where, that's what we are, we're stories. So my, the hypothesis that I'm playing with is that that level of narrative influences the world. It's two-way. It's not just a, the real world is physics and that's kind of some peripheral epiphenomena. No. It's the more emergent level of reality. It's the most emergent level of reality. And it's affecting the story. And that the different levels interact all the time. They're interacting now. You know, I'm going to use the power of the soul to lift my hand. Look, I just intended it. I don't know how I did that. I just said lift it. And it did. It's happening all the time. I'm, you know, I'm thinking ideas and I'm making, I don't know what, I'm, God knows what I'm doing with my mouth to make these funny noises, but it works. And that that's a general thing. So that it's, so that life is, can become, that when that becomes dominant, life becomes very dreamlike. And suddenly you're in, oh, you're in a numinous experience. And then it becomes quite cause and effect. And it's kind of mundane. And then, and that's, that's actually reality. And the big jump, why I think, you know, and when I, I did a TED talk in, in um, America last year, and I ended with this idea that I think a new understanding is coming, this trans-scientific understanding coming. And when it comes, it's going to have as big, perhaps a bigger impact as the scientific story did three, four hundred years ago. And look how big that's been. Because what it's going to do is it's going to go all of those things, the nature of the soul, what happens in psychedelics, life after death, uh, synchronicity, what I call narrativity. That's for real. That's actually the nature of reality. And we should understand that in the same way that we understand physics. It's all part of one thing. And when we get that, you know, everything changes. So this trans-science... Trans-scientific. It's a, so it, I mean, it's a, what I call the philosophy is actually univigilism because that's what it's for. But I describe it as trans-scientific just because it wants to transcend and include science, but a trans-scientific spirituality that brings the two together. So before we're there, before we're at this univigiality, uh, yeah. right now we have, uh, I know you take issue with this, but a divided world, um, you know, we, we have... Uh, we it's have right in some ways, that's right. Um, and, and, you know, there are problems, you look on the news, it's full of bloody problems all the time. Um, so, so uh, for those who want a, a better world that's transcended... Um, this this individuality yeah uh the, the the dreams of a world where we we assume our role as guardian caretakers of the planet and yeah. we we see ourselves as all, and all of us are awakened to our individuality how how do we what do we do to bring this about how do we how do we what's you know this final message how can we as individuals make this happen now how do we how do we create this heaven on earth uh, this this eden this this uh, um this united spirit of humanity um, well I mean uh, uh, that wouldn't sound like I'm just saying completely obvious things or, although probably I am we need to wake the hell up and then we need to support each other in doing that we need to endorse each other's individuality and, in, and support the growth into individuality and we need to engage and that means finding the love that's the, that's the, that's the oneness that's where we come from but the love's not enough. As much as I want, you know, that was the 60s thing. I grew up with that. All you need is love. I loved that. Beautiful. If only it were true. But it's not. Actually, you need wisdom. And I see love and wisdom as coming together. Love wisdom, like one thing. Because, you know, 
even in one's own life, you know, my, my dad he was a great guy, but he was an alcoholic. So I loved him. But how to love him was really hard. Because what was that? How did I express my love for him? Sometimes I expressed my love for him, it didn't harm. So I had to learn to be really quite tough because I loved him. I've seen the same in a different way with my kids. You know, when you bring up kids, you have to, you, you have to love so much that they'll hate you. So wisdom is what we need. And we need to find that wisdom in each other. So we, we, we need to gather together people of benign intent. And that is what I mean by a individual. Good people. Well, not even good people. Just people who aspire to be good people. Who really aspire to be good people. We need to gather those people together. And we need to, from that love, we need to think very, very carefully. And we need to find the wisdom that allows us to um, make the next step. And, in t and, and, and part of that is to be willing to be critical of each other as well. It's not, it's not about being nice. It's about being trusting each other enough that we can really push these things. Because I think we, we, can, we can make mistakes as well. You know, we can, you know, like you said, the news is always full of bad news because that's the nature of the news. You know, for every time you hear that some terrible thing has happened, uh, someone died on a, a policeman killed this person, the rest of the time, none of that's happened. Bill, Bill Hicks had great pieces about that. You know, the, the news never talks about the guy taking LSD and realizing his... Uh, you know. Yeah, one of, my, one of my heroes for that reason, exactly. So we need to be, we need to be canny um, and we need to, to support each other and, 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 and we need to have confidence as well. The, the whole point for me about looking back and going, hang on, in my lifetime, we've transformed the role of women. Never been seen before in history, in a few decades. Um, we've changed our attitudes towards sexuality, towards uh, homosexuality, all sorts of things. In no, no time at all. It, these things are unprecedented. If we can do that, we can do this. It, we just need to focus on it. We just need to, the, the, the ability, our consciousness, our create, we are the universe. And if we can f harness that creativity that's got us from hydrogen to here, we can solve this problem. We really, really can. And there's also a sense that the thing we're growing into, that narrativity that makes synchronicity happen, the dream, and also what I call God, because I don't know what other word to use, although it's a dangerous word, that benign thing, which is like calling us. You know, it, there's, there, the universe wants us to solve this. Of course it does. That doesn't mean we will. I'm not, I'm not going, it'll be fine. It's, well, I don't think that. I do think, though, that there's an evolutionary optimism that we can tune into that can give us the courage and the strength to, to make it happen. And, and, you know, there's lots of examples of things that were never going to happen. In my lifetime, the Berlin Wall was never going to come down. And then one day, it just came down. Or transformation in South Africa, or all sorts of things that I've witnessed in my short life. So these things happen. We can do it. And that's why it's so important to understand history. So we, we find the deepest current, which is the Gnostic current. I don't mean specifically the Christian Gnostics. I mean Gnostics everywhere. People who found that deep connection with the universe. We, that's coming out into the open now. We keep nurturing that. We grow our love. We grow our wisdom and we support each other. And then the people who have the insights and the talents in these particular areas, we find them and we follow what they're saying. I, I love all this and this would be a fantastic place to end but but there's one thing which I'm still not totally clear on and that's that's the, the how. So so the, the, the practical day-to-day -day me I'm going out in my car. How and you awaken? Stuff. How do I awaken and stay awake and stay in that bloody state where I am the universe and I love reality and I'm not this angry little guy in a car. You know, how, how, do I, how do I get there? Okay, so the first thing, I've said it already, but I'm just going to say it again, before, which is, look, nothing, you, there is no permanent state. I don't know anyone who's ever found one, and the people that claim it turn out to be not telling the truth, I think. So let's forget that fantasy. So what there is, is becoming more familiar with it, so that it becomes there more often, or you can go deeper into it. That's for real. I've done it in my own life. How do you do it? Actually, it's quite simple. It's exactly the same thing that you do to learn anything. 
you paying attention. It's as simple as that. You want to play the guitar? You know, it's like people, people with, with spirituality awakening, they, they kind of hope that the equivalent would be that I'd go and they'd suddenly be able to play. <laughs> it's like, no, you have to pick up the guitar every day and you have to play it. And then one day you'll pick it up and you go, I can do this. And then you'll see you could do it better. And there will never be a day where you go, I've arrived. There'll always be another thing you can do, another thing. And the same with this, in my experience. It just goes on and on and on. But you begin to have a love of it. So you give it your attention. And you realize that it's informing everything. So it's worth giving it to your attention. And then you find, oh, if I meditate, that helps. And then maybe you stop meditating. And you go, yeah, I'm not so interested in that now. I'm more interested in movement. And then maybe you do that. Or maybe you go into nature. Or maybe you write. Or maybe you create from it. Or maybe you go, I haven't got time for any of that now. I've just got to get on with political action. Or it's like, it doesn't matter. Because the thing you're developing is the thing which is in everything. And that's the thing you learn to put your attention on. Thank you, Tim. I understand. Thank you so much for all of these words. I appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. <laughs>